District of Conservation is sponsored by CFACT. To learn more about the organization, visit www.cfact.org. Hi, everyone. You are in for a treat today. I'm joined by Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia, an avid sportsman, Second Amendment supporter. He's been in the news recently, but we're going to talk about a different set of subjects. We're going to talk about the great outdoors, his thoughts on the Biden administration's gun control proposals, his war on energy, his thoughts on how to recruit new hunters and anglers to the sports, and other conservation-related subjects. So I think you're going to like what he has to say. And going off of the list of governors who voiced their concerns with 3030, we're going to explore that more in a separate monologue episode. But I wanted to ask the governor about that subject, too, because that was kind of breaking news last week with 15 governors, Republican governors, signaling their opposition and concerns with the Biden administration's plans to push 3030. And we've talked about that on two or three previous episodes. You can go back if you need a refresher course, but... We talked about a multitude of subjects. We had an interesting conversation. I think you'll be curious to hear what the governor had to say. And if you like it, feel free to share this conversation with your peers, with people in conservation, with newsmakers and others who may be interested. So share this podcast episode if you feel inclined and let me know what you think about our conversation. Check it out. Why don't we first start with how did you become a sportsman and interested in hunting and fishing? Well, you know, growing up, my dad didn't really hunt a, a lot. He he did a little bit of bird hunting, dove hunting, and so I was around that a little bit growing up. It was a lot of fun as a kid, but not a tremendous amount. But then my uh, my uncle, my mother's brother, got involved with the deer hunting club, and him and his wife did not have any kids, and so he started taking me. Gosh, he took me hunting when I was, you know, started i think when i was about 12 years old started deer hunting and i got hooked real quick but he was a big bass fisherman too so i used to go fishing with him a lot and so that's really where the the ball got started there i have fished in georgia and hunted in georgia before and it really is a beautiful and highly underrated place or sportsman's paradise you guys have a great steelhead fishery in the northern mountains the hog hunting is exceptional so i have seen Georgia's offering firsthand and can attest to that. Uh, What species have you targeted recently in the recent hunting season? Oh, gosh, I've done a little bit of everything. I have evolved over the years into being a big bow hunter. So I've I've deer hunted a lot, uh, especially with COVID, because a lot of events got canceled and I had more weekends free than normal. So I got to spend a lot of time in the deer stand this fall. And, and really through the winter, and then uh, I did a lot of a lot of hog hunting with my bow, um, kind of at the end and and after deer season, which was great. And then, good thing about being governor, you get invited to a lot of good dove shoots. So I got to go dove hunting quite a bit. Did a, a little bit of quail hunting, and then I've also done that's great fishing opportunities we're actually just leaving the coast of georgia right now and uh, people are i think triple fill, uh, triple tail fishing down here this time of the year i saw a lot of boats out yesterday but our inland waterways are and our rivers are unbelievable down here and like you said all the way to the north georgia mountains i saw a great picture of somebody catching some really big trout just north of atlanta which most people don't even realize you can do Yes, I learned that very personally when I got to fish in the Soqui River. And actually, Garden and Gun just featured the Soqui River and kind of the different offerings over there and how it's kind of an untapped trout fishery <laughs> up there. And it's so beautiful. And I, you know, I've all, and I kind of I kind of missed the, the in-between part, which is our, you know, big freshwater lakes. I mean, we've got some great lakes in Georgia I've fished. Um, not Probably not all of them, but I fished most of them for, you know, largemouth bass, striped bass, um, hybrid bass, and, you know, a lot of other things. So it's, uh, you can do a little bit of everything in Georgia. You certainly can. And how important is outdoor recreation to Georgia's economy, would you say? Oh, it's a huge, yeah, it's a huge part of our economy. I mean, it's, you know, when you think about, and we really saw that even 
more during COVID because a lot of the other states had closed their boat ramps down and state parks, and we never did. We kept those open. So we had a lot of people coming to, to fish and hunt in Georgia, which was just great for our small businesses and obviously our, you know, bait tackle, uh, obviously on the firearms industry side of things and, you know, camping gear and other things, just the whole, the whole, you know, hunting and fishing part of it has been huge for our state. A lot of residuals there in the economy. And do you feel that perhaps that hunting uh, access and the gains, something we talked about across the outdoor industry, those of us in media or just casual observers have noted that hunting has kind of been given a new life and same with fishing because of COVID and also just the uptick in licensed sales. Of, and how important is it to keep that uh, momentum going, do you think? Well, I think it's huge. I mean, it's great for our kids, number one. We have more kids that are getting hunting licenses and fishing licenses than they have in a long time. We have more people that are getting outside and going camping and doing other things. And all of that, to me, is tied together. I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time camping when I was hunting or fishing and still do today. And, you know, obviously I've been able to do that with our three daughters as well. And they're you know, they've gotten even more excited about that over the last year because of the pandemic. And I know that it's not only happening in Georgia, we're seeing that in other places. And that really kind of goes to the basis of your question of how, how does that help economically? I mean, it's been huge. You cannot find a boat now, new or used. I mean, our boating manufacturers are very busy. We have some of those here in Georgia, obviously. I know last year I was trying to order some uh, spinning reels and rods and like just about everything was back ordered, very hard to find. And so there's been a lot of demand out there. And I think it's great. I mean, look, getting kids and, and new people involved, not only in hunting and fishing, but just conservation and other things. I mean, it's, it's a healthy lifestyle. It's good for our citizenry. And I'm just, I'm really excited about it. And, and it brings a whole nother, you know, increased element to our economy and, and helping small business people. It certainly does, and somewhat related to conservation. I think people don't know how to piece these two items together, but there's a piece of legislation from the 1930s. You're probably familiar with the Pittman-Robertson Act or the Federal Wildlife, more yep. formal title of it, but PR funds. And people don't know the connection between that conservation funding and firearms and ammunition. And any smart person, I think, can put those two together and see that when you push, let's say, gun control legislation – People don't see the connection that doing that could chip away at this conservation funding. I want to segue into kind of your thoughts on firearms legislation, but how important is it for people to recognize that? And I know you being an avid Second Amendment supporter, sportsman, you have and probably share very big concerns about what is happening federally. So could you talk about that component and maybe what's on your mind in terms of federal legislation that concerns you and that could impact Georgia potentially? Well, you know, that's a great point. I really haven't thought about that before, even though we're a huge supporter and user of the Pittman Robinson funds. I mean, we're we're a very progressive state in making sure that we're protecting, you know, very important lands that we have around some of our waterways and other sensitive uh, land holdings that we have, whether protecting protecting the gopher, uh, gopher tortoise and other endangered or critical species here in the state, and also just preserving ability for all Georgians to have access to high quality land to you know hunt or fish on and Georgia has been doing that for a long time and those funds are absolutely I mean it's like every deal that we are doing with our friends in the conservation industry and movement uh, along with federal dollars that we're getting and state resources I mean it seems like those federal grants through that funding are a big part of just about every purchase or, or deal that we're doing on the conservation front. So that is a great point you made. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that is concerning about federal overreach. And a lot of people that are, you know, pro-gun control don't really think through those aspects. And, uh, you know, it's a, good, it's a good way to counter that argument. Yeah, because I, I can't exactly approximate how much percentage-wise, but I, I know it's at least 50% of those monies um, that come from guns and ammo to help fund that. 
And, and obviously the second amendment isn't about hunting. I think it's super important to make that distinction, but there is that connection obviously through that financial component, through excise taxes. And what is your worry that if, let's say legal gun ownership were to be curbed through all these different proposals we're seeing from the White House, how does that affect you think people's abilities to enjoy safe and responsible shooting sports activities? And again, with the Pittman Robertson component, um, is there anything in particular that jumps out at you that Biden is pushing, perhaps the deal to repeal immunity for gun manufacturers? I know you guys have several manufacturers, Daniel Defense and a few others in Georgia. Uh, we absolutely do and are, are recruiting more as we speak. I mean, we're a, we're a great state for, for gun part manufacturers, for firearms, you know, ammunitions and other things that, you know, our, our citizens, especially in certain parts of our state, are not only good customers, but they would love to work in a, a place like that. And we've seen that throughout the state. I mean, look, it is concerning with what the president's doing. I mean, the good news is a lot of the executive orders is more messaging on his stand, you know, from his standpoint versus changing the law. I think the real battle is obviously in the United States Senate and hoping that there's a, you know, a few moderate to, you know, center left or, you know, center Democrats like Joe Manchin and others and, you know, other Democratic senators that are from pro Second Amendment, pro self-defense, you know, whether it's hunting, shooting, carrying, you know, personal protection or whatever, will stand up and say, look, this is ridiculous for us to be trying to take away this right. It's one of the things that makes America great. And it's going to have negative effects as well. And I, I feel, I feel pretty good about that. Um, but it is, you know, going to continue to be a fight because you just have a lot of people that do not think that way. Uh, they think by taking everyone's firearms away and taking a, away the ability for them to defend themselves will help curb crime or curb violent crime. And that's just not the case. I mean, criminals are going to get firearms, and it's up to all of us to to be able to protect ourselves and our family and our property. And I know I'm a strong believer in, in that. That's one of the most fundamental rights that we have as Americans. Yes, you, you certainly have championed that. I remember uh, one of your first campaigns for office or uh, ads for office campaign ads. You, you definitely touted a strong support for the Second Amendment. And I wonder, would you follow the move of Governor Greg Gianforte in Montana? I believe he just promised or at least signed something into law to nullify any federal gun control legislation. Do you think you would perhaps replicate his effort to prevent them from being implemented um, in your state? And do you think other Republican governors or pro-Second Amendment governors would follow that same lead? Have you, have you heard of him trying to nullify the, any, any efforts to, to put federal laws into, into effect in his state? Yeah, I have seen some of that. I mean, look, the, the rule of law is going to trump you know, any executive order a, a governor does. I've had our attorneys looking at that. Um, you know, I've, I've sent that message myself. I don't necessarily need an executive order to do that. I mean, we're not going to allow anyone to, to come in and have overreach on the Second Amendment. Um, but the fact is, nothing that's happened at the federal level right now has changed anything that's out there. It's just messaging. Uh, the real fight is if there's a piece of legislation that actually would pull back the Second Amendment, pull back and, and you know, go down the route of gun control and other things. And that's what we got to be vigilant against. But our attorneys are kind of looking at that now to see if there is anything, you know, more that we could do in, in the state to be protective and to send that signal. Good to know. Have you seen a letter that also came out? Um, I don't think it was an RGA thing. I think it was just 15 governors coming about doing this, um, but are you familiar a little bit with musings about 3030? I think 15 of your colleagues just signed on to a letter expressing concern with, I think it's the Biden administration's promotion of it, and it sounds great on surface, and I've spoken to other sportsmen and women about this, and it, it has this, I would guess, good intention of protecting 30% of public waters and 30% of public lands, but it comes with a few caveats to it. We don't know who's going to manage public lands. Uh, we don't know who's going to largely fund it. Um, I think the governors expressed concern with how it's going to be administered. Uh, have you taken a look at that issue? I know you weren't a uh, signee of it, and that doesn't mean that you don't support concern. I know every state is different. I think also Governor DeSantis didn't sign on, um, but I was curious if you heard about that and if you could have some concerns down the road with 3030. Yeah, I mean, we didn't sign the letter. I just, you know, quite honestly, didn't have enough time to kind of really 
do the due diligence on the letter. But listen, it does concern me when you have federal mandates coming down. Um, you know, I'm a proponent of us knowing how to best handle the state of Georgia. You know, all politics is local. We're a lot closer to that than anybody in Joe Biden's administration is here in Georgia. And the same could be said for my colleagues, whether they're in California, Texas, or, you know, Wyoming, where you have, you know, broad land, small populations. And I think to try to have a one size fits all approach from the federal government. Uh, is concerning just on the basis, whether it was this issue or another uh, issue, dealing with that on elections as we speak. But I also think that the question of the management side is critical because, listen, federal uh, lands under certain administrations are treated very differently for access for a lot of different things, whether it's, you know, uh, energy, timber management, uh, managing for fires, you know, managing wildlife, having the opportunity to be part of that. Um, great experience, been able to hunt and fish those lands and, and other things. And I, I just think that the states can better figure out how to do that. Georgia, as I mentioned earlier, has been a leader in that regard as to, you know, having wildlife management uh, areas all around the state to give access to our sportsmen and conservationists and other people to be able to experience the great outdoors in the state of Georgia, whether it's on the coast, in the middle of the state, on some of our lakes and, um, you know, beautiful natural attractions, but also in our, our mountains as well, where everyone has access, even if they don't have a lot of financial means to be able to do that. And I think that's very important for us as a state. It's really the values of who we are and, and quite honestly, it makes Georgia a very attractive state for people to live. Because I always tell people we live in the best state in the country to live, work, and raise our families. Yeah, I, I can understand that for sure. And I think it's going to certainly get more movement, but I just was curious about your thoughts on it. Because I think a lot of people are concerned that this type of measure, which is more like a ceremonial type thing, it's not really codified into a bill yet, although there have been some resolutions in Congress to recognize it um, now because the makeup of Congress is different. They may try to get some movement on it, but I was just curious about your thoughts. So thank you for that. And I wanted to know more so what has been your response kind of to the greater conservation question about uh, the new administration's energy and environment, I would say, um, agenda items. I know last week they had unveiled different caveats and plans. Um, does anything in that uh, those um, plans concern you at all? potentially would affect Georgia's economy and also perhaps even management and, and preservation of the environment. Um, because I think we're seeing this sacrifice of the economy for the environment. And I think to anyone listening, they would say that's kind of a impractical idea or impractical thing to do where you could preserve both and you can focus on both. But do you worry that uh, when it comes to that, uh, their environmentalist kind of preservationist agenda, uh, is it going to affect Georgia in any way, do you think? Um, what concerns you the most from Biden's agenda with respect to energy and the environment? Well, the big, the biggest thing for me that I, concerns me about Biden is he has shown, you know, even in his first 100 days, that he's going to be drugged to the left by, you know, AOC and the other radicals, quite honestly, on these type issues. Um, and, and that is very concerning for us as a state. I mean, listen, I'm a conservationist myself. I mean, I'm a steward of our natural resources. I have a 400-acre timber farm that we manage, and we, we not only manage the timber, but we're protecting the river that we border because it's a beautiful natural resource, and it's part of the value of of that property, but also the value of us having the ability to have clean drinking water and other things. And um, you know, we we got many good stewards of our natural resources in Georgia, and we don't necessarily need the federal government telling us how to do that. But we also know that we've got to have a, a very diverse energy supply. I mean, we've been a leader when it comes to solar energy, but also, you know, building uh, two new nuclear reactors right now so that we have clean energy, you know, for the next 50 years here in the state of Georgia. And we continue to, dir- to diversify our energy portfolio, and I'm certainly very supportive of that. And obviously, uh, you probably think that oil and gas still play a role. How do you feel about kind of our country's shift away from energy independence? There were some secretarial orders handed down uh, from the Department of Interior. I know this doesn't really affect Georgia so much, but it seems like 
uh, it would certainly undermine energy independence. Um, obviously, you've taken the steps to include nuclear, which is what very few Democrats federally have talked about doing, unfortunately. Um, but, but do you see, obviously, all of the above still being relevant, even against kind of what is being promulgated in Washington? Well, you know, George is not dependent on oil and gas as much as, you know, for revenue, like states like Texas and, and some of our West, you know, Midwestern and Western states or some of our Northeastern states. So, I mean, I have a little bit different perspective, but but that being said, I do think it's prudent for us to be energy independent. I don't know why we wouldn't have a diverse portfolio. And, you know, I'm, I'm a believer as a small business owner for over 35 years, including today, that we need to let the market drive that, but also do, as we all know, we should continue to work on environmental issues so that we preserve this great world and planet that we have. And, and I think that's exactly what we're doing in Georgia. And you got to have a, a, a really good balance to be able to do that. And I think if we get out of balance, that's going to have negative repercussions for our citizens. And does it worry you that some of these proposals would essentially elevate China economically? I think that's the impression I get that um, they're not doing mining here domestically, uh, for solar and for other alternative energy sources. So is it going to make us more dependent on China or countries abroad, um, do you think? No, I think that's a great point. And listen, we've seen that. I mean, we're seeing it now. I mean, Georgia right now is being a leader in the electric vehicle manufacturing um, market, I guess you could say. And I think we're going to benefit greatly from that in the years ahead as the industry moves toward um, a lot more electric vehicles in the next five to ten years than we've ever seen, and uh, it's pretty incredible what is happening in regards to that. But it does take a lot of rare, rare earth minerals to power those vehicles, and we know that very well with the new SK battery plant that we have under construction in Georgia, and they're building batteries for electric vehicles right now. And I actually toured that plant a little over a week ago. So, I mean, we understand that, but I've also seen firsthand, and this was evident during the middle of the global pandemic, when we were monopolized by China on a lot of our uh, personal protective equipment that we were purchasing and needed in our state and our country when we couldn't get it, as well as a lot of pharmaceuticals and other things. And I think if that taught me anything, is we cannot, I mean, it really made the point about uh, China's dominance and really the monopoly they hold in many of these things, not just in medical supplies and PPE, but also in rare earth minerals and other things. So we, I, I think it's prudent on us to really be smart, but also be balanced in that regard in the future to protect not only our economy um, and our environment, but also to protect us from a national security perspective. Before I let you go, Governor Kemp, how do you think Republicans can channel what you've said uh, during our discussion and lead on these conservation and environmental issues? What is your recommendation for people who are like, what, how can Republicans lead or how are they leading? So what would be the, your message to those people? Well, I think we're in a really good position to message that right now. And I think the Democrats, as they normally do when they get full power in Washington, they're overreaching and some of the things that they're doing. Just mainstream America or mainstream Georgia does not think that is a good way to go. And I think we can bring a common sense, practical solution to protecting the environment, being pro conservation, pro, you know, hunting, fishing, Second Amendment, and other things that most reasonable people want to be able to do, um, and be a voice of reason in, in all of this and, and practical. And I think in the past there's been times where Republicans haven't been good messengers on that, but I think that is changing rapidly, and it's a little easier to post up against. AOC when when they're just trying to you know say ridiculous things like having you know no gasoline no diesel fuel in the future and that's just not realistic in today's world and most people realize that but they do support a balanced approach. Thank you so much, Governor Kemp. And uh, where can people follow your work and connect with you and your office if they're interested to learn more? Yeah, Brian Kemp GA is probably the best. Obviously, our Facebook page and and just the. Uh, Georgia Governor's Office website. Awesome. Thank you so much, Governor Kemp. It was lovely chatting with you. I wish you success in your future outdoor endeavors and 
Dave, of course, I know you've had a lot of pressure on you for other related issues relating to the election law. So thank you so much for speaking with me and, and sharing your thoughts on why you're a sportsman and, and the importance of preserving conservation. That's great. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you to Governor Brian Kemp for taking time to join us on the podcast. If you enjoyed this conversation with the 83rd governor of Georgia, make sure you hit subscribe, download past episodes, and leave us some reviews. I would love your feedback on this episode and our past interviews we've had in the recent weeks. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to never miss a beat nor a guest announcement. I am heading to Texas tomorrow where I will be participating in a media event with some gun manufacturers. I will report back to you all how that went. You'll see some stuff on social media. And because of that, I will postpone some recent interviews I did that I was planning to publish and put them out next week for the sake of them getting more listenership. You will be hearing from Thomas McCauley, Executive Director of POMA, Professional Outdoor Media Association, and from Samuel Ayers of the Wild Initiative, a fellow Californian and a new Montanan and fellow POMA member as well. Until those episodes come down the pipeline, make sure you guys share. If you like what you are seeing here, encourage your friends to find us, download, subscribe. We've had some issues with Apple recently since they've updated their model. There were some back-end issues. I think those are all resolved now, but make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss a beat from us. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to hearing from you all very soon. Happy fishing and happy hunting.